Good morning, faith community. We are back again talking about Thanksgiving. The passage that I wanted to, to look at today is First Chronicles 16, starting in verse 34. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And say, Save us, God of our salvation. Gather us and rescue us from the nations, so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. Blessed be the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that we, we see at the, the beginning of this, and even the Second Chronicles is, is in the Old Testament. This is coming out of, of David um, and his heart for thankfulness. But in our, in our minds, sometimes we think of the Old Testament God and the New Testament God of being two separate gods, right? And the New Testament God is gracious and loving and the Old Testament God is, you know, vengeful and full of wrath and, you know, like the bully on the anthill, just zapping people whenever he wants. But we see here that, that David clearly recognizes that there's, there's the God is, is loving, that he's merciful, that he's gracious, and that he has that, that faithful love. Mm. And so even though David is has experienced trials in his life and trials even in his his leadership in the nation of Israel is has faced trials. He says that that God's faithful love endures forever. And and some of us and some uh, watching at home might might look at our current situation and and think of what we're what we're going through. And uh, leaders seem to be getting more and more bold in how they. They want to attack Christianity and our beliefs, and uh, we're, we're drifting further and further from from uh, a society that's built on the truth of God's word. And so, with with that in mind, how can we in 2020 uh, look at God and see that He He still has faithful love? Hmm. I think that He, I mean, what's the first thing that it says in this verse? Is give thanks to the Lord for He is good and God's the one who gives authority hmm. to anybody who has authority anywhere. And I think it's really important to remember that, that his sovereignty doesn't waver over any of this. And um, and what's repeated here uh, in a lot of the Psalms that David says is faithful love endures forever. And there's no, there's no end to that. Mm-hmm. This isn't, I mean, somebody getting elected that we don't want to get elected isn't the end of, of God being in control. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I've, I've seen some... Uh, people on social media say like, "Oh, this is it," and almost as if like, "Oh, God, God just lost it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, He's, he doesn't have control anymore, and now it's about to run amok." It's um, God doesn't. Uh, God's not in control. How I'm in control over my house. He's in control, as in He knows every little thing that goes on. And in fact, He's the one who even gives breath to the people who mock Him mm. or the people who are against Him. So that's how in control He is. I think it's really important to remember here. Yeah. We often, I think, define goodness in terms of our expectation, right? Right. Um, like a, a good marriage will look this way, right? A good country will do these things, um, but those those are based on our expectation. Goodness is defined based on God. God is good, right? Man is not, right. um, and what that means is that His decisions, His His sovereign decisions for us as a nation, for us as a people, for us as families, it's good. Because he is in control. And what I, what I want to point out too, verse 35, he says, save us, God of our salvation. So he's saying that God is good. His faithful love, his, that's that word has said, endures forever. But he's in a place where he needs salvation, right? Yeah. And so the goodness isn't we've, we've been saved. And so now we're going to recognize that you are good. We're still in this place where we need rescue. We are still in the place where we need you to preserve us. Without you, we have nothing. We're a, we're a needy people and we're always going to be a needy people. And sometimes the political situation makes us even more aware of our need, but God's faithful love endures forever. So, so what does that mean? That means that no matter what our circumstances are, God is faithfully loving us. And I think the reason that we have trouble believing that is because we define love as niceness, right? right? right. Yeah. God, who's going to show faithful love, that means he's going to give me what I want. And I want this president yeah. to rule, right? I want um, this executive order to be overturned. I want um, this uh, set of justices on the Supreme Court, right? I want those things, and I can see, like, wow, if those, that would be good. 
Right. But God's love is faithful. That means it just endures forever. That's why he uses both words right there. This love is giving us not necessarily what we want, but what we need. Yeah. And, and his church is going to thrive. Yeah, that's a, that's a massive difference between what we what we need and what we want. And, yeah. and we see it, you know, in in the lives of of our children and they have things that I need this. Like mm-hmm. no, no, no. You don't need more Halloween candy. Like you want more Halloween candy. It'd be nice if you got more Halloween candy, but I am good in limiting the amount of Halloween candy that that you're going to get. Uh one of the the, the things that that I think about um, when I'm reading this passage, and I'll, I'll get your guys' thoughts on this as well, is when it talks about, uh, you know, save us, God of our salvation, in verse 35, gather us and rescue us from the nations. And then the, the reason that David wants to be saved and, and rescued from the nations, he says, so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. Mm. And I think for, for, for some of us, the temptation is to equate like our political beliefs with our our spiritual beliefs Mm -hmm. and we want to you know we want those supreme court justices we want that president we want you know this majority in the house and the senate and we we equate those things to you know our our spiritual life and so we say we want religious freedom and some of the some of times what we mean is we want conservative leadership and it's it's a totally different thing and so what do you what are your guys' thoughts on on that and and why does David want to be rescued from the nations? Hmm. I'll start with you, Pastor Kilim. Yeah, you know, um I I had somebody recently I I posted um the Equality Act on my Facebook, and I said, hey, we need to be praying about this. This is really dangerous for the church. If this passes, it's really gonna take away our, our liberties. And one of my friends commented on there. He said, Well, shouldn't shouldn't Christians expect persecution? Yeah. Right, and I said, and I replied to him. I said, "Yeah, we're supposed to expect persecution, but we're supposed to pray for our leaders so that we can have peace." And so, um, it's important for us to recognize it's fine for us to to pray for for godly leaders. It's pr- fine for us to pray that God would even um, protect us from persecution. But what's key here, what David is showing us, is you need to be asking for the right reasons. Right. So we don't go to God and say, oh, you know, I'm going to be stronger if I'm persecuted, so God persecute me. We don't want to pray for persecution. <laughs> we can trust God that when persecution comes, it's what we need. But when we cry out for rescue, we need to make sure that we're crying out for the right reason. Right. And so what he's saying right here is rescue us from the nations so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. So if our desire for religious liberty is so that we can have a comfortable Christianity, that's the wrong reason. The reason we want to be rescued is so that we can praise his name. It's not because um, worshiping in a comfortable environment is essential. It's because worship is essential. Right. And so, so oftentimes um, we, we sort of have our hearts maybe pointing the wrong way when we're asking for rescue. The right way is I want to be rescued so I can have more freedom to give thanks to your name. And, and, you know, sometimes I look at my life and I see there's not a lot of thanksgiving in my life. Maybe there's not a lot of reason for God to rescue me, for him to deliver me. Maybe I need to sort of have this this freedom attacked a little bit more Mm. to value the freedom to worship, to to be rescued so that I can give thanks to his name. Yeah. Yeah, we shouldn't be strangers to the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I think we've, we've had freedom for, you know, before even any of us were born that our forefathers fought for. And since we're here in comfort of freedom and all of a sudden it's under fire Mm -hmm. we don't know how to react to it because this just hasn't really happened before so when we're when we are crying out for rescue um in my heart i'm tempted to cry out for rescue because i don't want to pay more taxes and (laughs) i don't want to wear a mask and i don't want to you know a b and c but i mean really it has to be for like for the lord we have to turn it away from us and to him and say i want freedom so that i can worship you in mm-hmm. freedom. I mean, yeah, obviously I'm not going to pray for persecution or, or for, uh, for it to be harder to worship him, but I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be keeping my eyes on him in the midst of this, I'm praying for, 
uh, for what is good, praying for what at least I think would be, you know, in in the best interest of the church being able to worship him in freedom. But um, even when it seems like it's just in my eyes going to get worse and worse, I have to take a step back and see the bigger picture of what he's doing. Hmm. You know, it reminds me this this cry out for rescue that we may give thanks. It reminds me of the the Israelites mm, um, when yeah. they're in captivity in Egypt. Um, so there, it says their cries reach to God's ears, right? And He remembered His people, um, and then He sends He sends Moses to them to rescue them. Um, speak to that for me. Like, what what do we learn from the story of the Israelites about a heart that is aligned with giving thanks for the right reason? Right. I think so. It's the the, the Exodus story is. That's that's an aspect that's often overlooked, mm. right? That that Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, "Look, let my let let God's people go and and make sacrifices," and then the the expectation is that they would they would come back, right? They would they would come back and they would continue their their labor for the Egyptians, and, and Pharaoh says no, and so God, you know, says, "Okay, let's 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 you know move them completely out of Egypt into the Promised Land," but like that that first idea, the the first the first. And primary reason for for leaving Egypt was always to have the freedom to be able to worship God, offer sacrifices to God, uh, to to live lives for God that was an abomination to the Egyptians. And yet, as soon as the 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 Israelites are freed, we almost see that that that's no longer the primary reason, mm-hmm. right? They want comfort, and as soon as they they hit a little bit of adversity, like let's go back to Egypt. Uh, as soon as as things aren't going quite their way. They they start reaching back to try to, to make things comfortable for themselves, and they want to have, you know, things good on in a, in an earthly sense rather than, you know, the ability to to freely worship God. And I think that's a huge reason why they spent forty years taking a trip that should have taken them, I don't know, much shorter than that, is because their their priorities were realigned, and so. You know, one of one of my fears is that we as Christians wouldn't learn from from our history, right? Mm-hmm. And that we would uh, pray for freedom, ask for freedom, vote for freedom, you know, protest for freedom, and do all these things, and then and then we get it and we we squander it, mm-hmm. and we, we waste it on right. on frivolous things, meaningless things, and uh, I I don't I don't want to see that happen. Um, I would almost rather have. Uh, persecution than than that yeah yeah it's interesting that i think we've gotten a little bit of a glimpse with uh covid19 this past year where we weren't meeting together as a church when this all started and we were all kind of stuck at home and kind of scrambling to figure out how we're gonna gather together as a church but that freedom had somewhat been taken away Mm -hmm. i mean everybody was kind of on board with it because we weren't really sure about what was going on but i mean for me you know, I'm busy on Sunday mornings. I got a lot of stuff to do. And in my mind, I was really tempted to uh, think of, you know, Sunday as like not necessarily a day of rest, but just a day of another day of work and mm-hmm. coming to just do, get the job done and then go home. Uh, and then once that freedom of Sunday was taken away, um, I really, really missed it. And then we came back afterwards and I'm more busy than before because we're doing live stream and doing other stuff. But this is like, it's one of the best places I could possibly be. I feel so at home serving the Lord, doing the ministry together. And so like, I'm, I'm sure that's it for a lot of people where they didn't have the, uh, the um, freedom taken away originally here. And then once it's taken away, they come back after that and, they, and they've understood how important it is to be together as a church and how special it is to be able to uh, serve him in the freedom that we have and not, uh, and not wasting it. Yeah. You know, God's has said it endures forever. His faithful love endures forever, no matter what our circumstances are. But in the midst of that, sometimes his love is faithful and our freedoms are being stripped away from us. Mm-hmm. When we're crying out, when we're, we're giving thanks, because we know right now his faithful love is enduring, even though there's some tension with our freedoms, right. we need to make sure that our hearts are desiring more freedom so we can give more thanks. Right. Right. And, and so just I, I challenge you as you're listening, I challenge us here to make sure that we're aligning our hearts with that true purpose, that we're created to worship. And part of that worship is giving thanks. Are we wanting freedom so they, that we can worship? Are we, are we 
really desiring to, to gather together as a church freely so we can worship God? Or is it just a, another social club? Or is it just another option for a right. Sunday where I could do A, B, or C, and I want to keep my options open? Right. We need to make sure that we're not, we're not desiring comfort and convenience, but that our desire is that God would set us free so that we can worship Him. It's so important to understand we're designed to be a thankful people, and we want freedom so we can continue to be that thankful people. Yeah, a- amen to that. And we'll, we'll continue our series on thankfulness, and I think as, as maybe we hear Pastor Caleb's challenge and we think like, ah, oh, my heart just isn't isn't quite there that I don't mm. I don't feel that priority. I encourage you guys to, to continue listening uh, through through the next devotionals we'll have, and and we'll try to give uh, advice from God's word mm-hmm. and and pray that the Spirit would uh, illuminate those those reasons for, to give thankfulness uh, in the coming days and weeks. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.